conversation with the candidate continues right now. Thank you for clicking on our extended digital conversation with the candidate, with Republican candidate for president, Governor Doug Burgum of North Dakota. We're going to try to get to as many of our town hall questions as we possibly can. We're going to get things started with Greg Bogus. Hi there, Governor. Thanks for coming to New Hampshire. Greg, good to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, a question uh, you've touched upon a couple times. Uh, what do you think America's obligations are to Ukraine in their fight with Russia? Well, I think our obligations to Western Europe are significant. These are our allies. And Ukraine, uh, you know, we belong to NATO. We've got all these countries in NATO. And who's actually fighting the war? Who's dying? Ukraine is actually doing the work of NATO, even though they're not a member, because they're actually on the front lines. So I think it's important that we support them. Do we support them with a blank check? No, because we have to have some accountability in every aspect of government. When we're sending these kinds of dollars overseas, we need to do that. Uh, but as we can see, when we're fighting against Russia, we can't even think about it as even like a, a country the way we think about ourselves, because it's really, we now can see even more clearly, it's a large criminal enterprise. It's run more like a mafia state. And, and the whole thing with Prigozhin and the Wagner group you know, that's not just mercenary soldiers fighting in Ukraine. They're, they've got 65 shell companies. They've taken over, they've taken over oil fields in Syria. They get 25% of the oil out of Syria. They, they, they're taking over diamond and gold mines in the Central African Republic. Putin himself, it's estimated to be worth $70 billion now. I mean, how do you go into public service and become, and you know, have that happen to you? So, and, and then the whole thing of, oh, Prigozhin's a bad guy, and oh, no, maybe he just met with Putin. We don't have the intelligence, obviously, to understand, I mean, you know, the kind of, military or civilian intelligence to fully understand what's going on, but we know that this is all criminal activity between them and the oligarchs. So I, I think we, we have to stand up against that. And as I you know, mentioned in the, the preview early on, what we're doing to sanction Russian oil so that China can get it cheaper, we have to think through the whole global strategy. It's not just one, one thing or the other, but providing more energy to Western Europe. If we were doing that, if we'd been doing that, I don't think the Ukraine war even starts. The way you stop wars in the first place is you have strong deterrence and you are smart enough to say, we're not gonna let all of our allies in Western Europe and all of our allies in the Pacific because we have the same problem going on in Japan and the Philippines, South Korea, all of those countries are dependent on foreign oil as well. And you can't get a natural gas pipeline built from the Permian in Texas or New Mexico or the Bakken in North Dakota to the West Coast. The ambassador from Japan said they would buy the next 20 years of clean liquid natural gas from America. The, 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 the supply chain would be along British Columbia, along the Aleutians and into Japan. Instead, a country of 126 million people, our biggest partner, Japan, is getting all of their oil and gas you know, from the, from the Middle East. And it's coming through the South China Sea. They know China's got the biggest Navy in the world. They understand that. I was over there in a trade mission in October when North Korea fired a missile over the top of Japan. And then we say, oh, well, we're, you know, where's the missile coming back? It would have come back from North Dakota, from the missile defense here. But I said, what are you guys doing about the energy? You have no energy security here. They said, well, we're stockpiling Australian coal on the ground in case we end up having d disrupted supply chain. So if you cared, again, if you cared about the, the environment, you would want us providing our clean energy to people like Japan and to Western Europe. It'd be good for the environment, good for global stability. We're empowering dictators with our crazy 180 degrees backwards energy policy. Thank you. Other than that, I don't feel passionate about it, but I mean, that's okay. <laughs> Next question comes from Leonard Morrill. <laughs> Hi, Leonard. Welcome. You are a state's right person. Name program or agencies in the federal government mm -hmm that you would support returning the power to the states? Well, I think we have a, a number of them that we have to look at because within them, there are all kinds of programs that were, that were chartered initially, maybe through law, but then through executive order and just through overreach, they grew. And I take a look at the EPA for number one. I mean, every state has got its own Department of Environmental Quality. We've got a great one in North Dakota. And guess what? In a state where 90% of the land is either a farm or a ranch, and most of it multi-generational. Do you think that some bureaucrat in DC cares more about what's going on with our soil health and what cares more about what's going on in our streams or more what goes on in the air that our kids and our grandkids are breathing than we do? I mean, it's offensive to me that they think that they're gonna try, they wanna bigfoot us with some one size fits all federal rule when, when we care about this more deeply. And I'm sure it's the same in New Hampshire that there isn't anybody 
you know, in DC that's gonna care more about what's going on with the New Hampshire environment than people that live here and multi-generational people that do. So that's one where the overreach is just nonstop. I mean, Waters of the USA, we had to fight that in federal court. That would have affected almost 95% of the farmland in North Dakota, which affected, would have done nothing for the environment, but it would have raised the price of food for all of you and everybody that eats it. I mean, the Department of Education isn't the biggest one, you know, 4,000 people. Some of the other agencies have 80,000, but you know, with the budget approaching $70 billion, you know, education, drive that, you know, back. In North Dakota, we, 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 we have a very small, you know, Department of Public Instruction, we drive it out to 175 school districts. I mean, the principle that, that we need to think about is innovation, not regulation. All these agencies think their existence is to regulate and create one size fits all. The way we win the Cold War that we're in with China right now, the way we win that is to have our economy go from crawling or going backwards to sprinting. It's the way Reagan won the Cold War in the 1980s as we got our economy going. And the way we do that is 50 platforms of innovation, the states where the innovation occur, and it's not gonna occur with bureaucrats in Washington. So it's, you'd have to go through, what's the mission? What's, the states created the federal government. There's actually a certain things that they're supposed to do. And if it's not what they were supposed to do, then return it to the states or to the people. That's where it would go. But anyway, I, I think I, I've got a long list as a governor because I'm on the receiving end of it and we should be spending less money suing the federal government and more money just uh, either not spending the money at all or letting, this, letting us go innovate with our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Ken Berlin. Hi, Governor. Hey, Ken. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going to try to meld two policies together. Perfect. One is abortion and the other one is gun control. Okay, let me be sure I got all my notes together. Uh, I know that you signed a bill which now has abortions being done at six weeks. Okay, before they had the 22 weeks, then it got changed to six weeks, if I remember correctly. Is no, that wrong? That's wrong. See, I'm already off. Yeah. <laughs> there was okay. a total ban. There was a trigger bill from 2007 that had a total ban with criminalization before mm -hmm. the less restrictive one was signed okay. this spring. All right. Well, that's one step on abortions. Okay. But the other thing I want to talk about is the gun control issue. Okay. I know you're a Second Amendment sanctuary state. Not, not a sanctuary state necessarily, but I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of, of Second Amendments. Right. Okay. Uh, and I noticed that uh, you protect firearm manufacturers from lawsuits. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, I got something right. Yes. Yeah, you go. <laughs> okay. So my question is, when you are so concerned about life, you know, being a pro-life person, and whether or not I agree with you is immaterial, but then you have freedom of having guns all over the place. And, you know, I don't think the Founding Fathers thought AR-15s was going to be part of the Second Amendment. Maybe they did, but I don't think so. But what does it take in order to get some kind of, you know, red flag laws, uh, prohibit AR-15s, which they did before, raise the age to get a gun up to 21, that would save lives. Now, it's not going to save them all. We know that. It's not the answer to everything, and we know that. I'm tired of hearing about mental health is going to solve this problem. So I'm wondering, when you're trying to save lives of the unborn, then why can't we save lives of our children at school and the currently born? That's my question. No, thoughtful <laughs> questions. Uh, let me just start with uh, uh, the abortion rights. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of Dobbs. Dobbs says re returns that power to the states, uh, and that's where it should be. Each state should make that decision. Uh, and what works in North Dakota uh, is not going to work for New York. It's not going to work for California. It doesn't even work for Minnesota. Uh, may not work for New Hampshire, so that has to be left to the states. When we talk about the Second Amendment and the, the gun control, uh, well, you're of the mindset that you're tired of people talking about mental health. The people that, that feel we need more mental health are tired of people saying that we're going to solve all the problems with more restrictive gun control because we have, we have large metros that have passed some of the laws that you've described and there hasn't been a correlation between them having stricter gun laws and having fewer gun deaths. And so what this would, re, what unfortunately, like a number of these divisive topics in our country, 
They're great for politics because each side is able to get out the vote. Each, is, each side is able to raise money around, hey, the other side doesn't agree with what we're doing. So it becomes good, good for politics and good for clickbait, but it isn't good for problem solving. And one of the things that we've learned in North Dakota is when we have people that disagree, we have to figure out some way to have people together actually listen with respect and figure out a way, is there a possibility to find a solution? Is there a solution? Because, you know, there isn't anybody that's a gun owner that wants to see, you know, a, a mass shooting. There's not one that would want to would want to see that. And and on, in, and so we, 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 we can find common ground on 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 these issues, but it requires listening and it requires convening. It doesn't necessarily, the first step isn't necessarily like pass a law that everybody else hates so that when they get elected, they can repeal that law. You know, this is this volleying back and forth that doesn't lead to real solutions. Mm -hmm. And so this is an area where again, and, and of course when, when we're torn apart as a country around some of these issues, you know who loves that? Everybody that hates democracy, they're going to go, this is why democracy is going to fail. This is why China is going to prevail. This is why, why it, you know, and, and with the open access to social media and 40% of those accounts might be bots that are, could be run by, you know, when I say bots, they're not even people. But I know in the state of North Dakota, we get attacked every day by China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. They pay people to come to work and do cyber attacks against our tribes, against our school districts, against our cities, and against our state. They're trying to get at people's data. They do ransomware against universities and tribes. They were even trying to get into information related to the parents of the people that are doing the ground security for the National Missile Defense, who are National Guard soldiers, trying to get in through a school district's power school. So these are our real challenges and our real enemies. They love it when we're fighting with each other, but we have to use the, the tools of soft power, which is the way we've building community, listening to each other, getting people together, finding the common ground. But they're, the groups that are organized to do this, they, don't, they benefit when there's more controversy. We have to have a leader that's willing to convene the people from both sides and listen with respect to both sides. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Governor, the Dobbs decision does allow Congress to act. As president, if a 15-week abortion ban landed on your desk, would you sign it? Well, I think to be consistent, if you believe in state rights, you'd have to say, why is the federal government doing this? The whole point uh, is to let states decide as opposed to trying to have a one-size-fits-all answer. So I, I would, I, right now, I would say no. I, if it's left to the states, that means it's left to the states. You can't have it both ways. Next question from Karen Ulmerdorsch. Hi, Karen. Hello, I'm a Midwesterner originally also, and I do love North Dakota. Great. Um, I firmly believe that the crisis we face today in the number of young people who are committing suicide is directly linked with the stress they're receiving due to the tremendous debt they have incurred from furthering their education. If elected, what specific measures would you take to address this problem? Well, Karen, I think you've got two big things here. I mean, the, the rash of suicides that are going on and whether it's the fact that we're losing like 22 veterans a day yeah. across this country, uh, young people that we're losing, this gets back to the behavioral health, mental health, health issue. And for, for the youngest people, uh, and whether it's for school safety, or for other things, we've got to figure out a way to have mental health professionals in every school building, not just in every school district. I mean, that has to be part of what's going on. Teachers can't teach if there's behavioral issues. Teachers can't teach if kids don't feel safe. And part of that safety relates to behavioral health and mental health. But we have to then ha we have to have more people that choose that as a career. We've got to support that. We've got to make sure we've got our reimbursements set up in the healthcare system uh, to do that. But on the college debt side that you're referring to, again, one of the things that frustrates me uh, as a, a, you know, both as a parent and now as, as a governor, because in North Dakota, we've had programs that have been sponsored in North Dakota where we help kids in North Dakota with their college, with college loans. That we've got like a $1.2 billion of college loans out there that the state has been in this business. And when we've done that, we said, hey, if you come to work for us, I mean, if you, if you consolidate your more expensive federal loans to a state loan at a lower interest rate to save them some money, great. Well, then the federal government comes along and says, oh, well, if you got a federal loan, we're just going to forgive it. We're just going to, and 
I was absolutely opposed to, the, to Biden's plan to forgive a half a trillion dollars of student debt because in America, we're built, if you borrow money, you're responsible for paying it back. And the kids, we, had, we knew in North Dakota, there were kids that didn't go to college. They went to a trade school, got a job, and paid all their bills. And then a friend or a sibling went to college, didn't get a degree that could create a job, had piled up a bunch of debt, but we're gonna forgive them. So basically I look, this is you know, blue collar workers forgiving the debt of you know, some white collar kids that maybe weren't able to pay off their debt. That didn't make any sense. And relative to North Dakota student loans, if someone was smart enough to get out of their high cost federal debt and take a loan from North Dakota, they, got, they were gonna get nothing. So the person that made the bad financial decision got the relief. So I looked at this from 10 different angles, said we can't, we can't do that. So you say, what's the root cause? The root cause is the federal government shoved so much money into higher education the last 20 years, like that was gonna be the end all be all, the same way we've shoved money into healthcare. The two things, the two industries that it, whose inflation has been continuous from 2000 on, healthcare, you've all seen it in your insurance rates, and higher education. Tuition has gone up nonstop that whole time. Has, the, has education gotten better commensurate with those higher prices? No, it's because the federal government was said, you know, go to college, we'll give you a loan. Here's a bunch of loans. Oh, we'll forgive your loans. I mean, I, I don't understand what that is. College universities are faced with four sort of unstoppable forces right now, which is the, you know, the demographics, there's less 18 to 22 year olds that are going, two, the economic pr pr proposal used to be, hey, if you went to college, you, you were gonna have a better life and you're gonna have make more income. That's not necessarily true today because of what the skills you can get through certificate programs. I mean, kids that go to a 16 week coding school to learn how to do computer coding can get the same pay as someone who's got a four year college degree, only they might know the current language instead of an old language. And then, uh, so if it's demographics and economics and then technologically COVID blew up the whole college model because they used to be sort of defensible monopolies based on geography. And now you can, you know, kids, kids in every state can go to a different university and don't have to leave, uh, leave their, their, their hometown. And then culturally, I mean, all of us know the story of families that said, hey, we're gonna sacrifice everything so our kid can get to college and we're the first family member to ever graduate from college and all the pride that went with that. Well then today, it's like that, that celebration is no more because what you've got is a bunch of college debt and you may not have a job to be able to pay for it. So I have said long before I became governor, higher education was in big trouble and the answer wasn't for the federal government to throw more, lo more loans, more grants, more anything at it. The people that need educational help, we can provide it to them, but as a country, we've got to figure out how to give people the tools they need at a better, more efficient price. And there are so many great certificate programs and kids now in North Dakota, career and technical training, they can get their first year of a degree while they're still in high school. They get the second degree their freshman year and they got a $72,000 job and no, no debt. And I've met, I've met them. I mean, October of their, what would be their freshman year, they've already been hired at 72 grand and they have no college debt. And guess what? The company that's hiring them will pay for their college if they want to continue their education. So we have to just break our mindset around this. In North Dakota, we said kids have got to be choice ready, not college ready. Choice ready means, can you pass a military exam? A lot of high school kids can't pass the physical exam or the academic exam to get in the military. So they got to be choice ready for the military, choice ready for career and technical education or choice ready for college if they want to choose to do it. But our universities have got to figure out a way to become more competitive in a market. They've got real competition right now. And we, it's not, not the government's job to keep defending, defending a model that is, is under a lot of stress. Thank you. That was Enjoy a lot, your that was a lot of it. Thank you, but thanks for the question, Karen. We have an online question coming from Peter Tilton Jr. who asks, how do you feel about, oh, you can get some water too if you need some, Governor. You, so yeah, <laughs> Peter Tilton Jr. asks, how do you feel about former President Trump's legal issues? And will you disavow total allegiance to the former president if he is convicted? Uh, this, Americans today, there's a bigger issue than the one question that was asked. It's related to that, but it's a bigger issue is many Americans today feel that they're we have a double standard in our justice system. They feel that we're applying, one, we're applying the law one way for one political party and another way for another political party. And that mistrust in, in, at the highest levels, specifically with the DOJ 
and to some degree with the FBI, that level of mistrust is, is erosing, eroding our belief in the, the foundations of democracy. And if we can't have as a country, if more than half the country says they're not playing by the rules, this is this, you know, that's a, this is a thing, this is the same, then take it down to a city where we've got cities that have said, hey, if you shop list less than $900, we're not gonna prosecute you. I mean, if the rule of law is disappearing at every level in our country, we have got big, big problems. So th there has to be a change where we rebuild trust in these institutions in terms of, of, of how we do that, because that same question could be asked, uh, you know, relative to not just President Trump, but President you know, Biden asked the same question. I mean, you know, are, and, and, and people would say, hey, are these rules being applied fairly and equally across all the stuff? I think that's the much bigger issue. In terms of the prosecution, though, you think it's unfair that President Trump is being prosecuted? No, I'm just saying that I think it, that you could people can make the argument that that, and, and, and again, to the rest of the world, how does this look? We have a sitting president; their DOJ is going after someone that is appears to be the uh, you know a political rival. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you know happens in third world countries, and and you'd say, okay, then wh where's the is one side gets a slap on the wrist and the other side gets accused of you know of all these felonies? I mean, I, I can understand why people would say, hey, is there a double standard here? But for but again, back to my other thing, you know who loves when we're doing this? Again, this is this talking about documents. You know, I was in the tech business. When I'm president, there will not be a document management problem. We have a document management problem. I mean, because we had, you know, emails with Hillary, we had uh, Vice President Pence, we had President Trump, we had, you know, Biden with the boxes in his garage next to his Corvette. I mean, there, the, all of these things are, that's a document management problem. I mean, either A, why do we have paper? B, you know, and have it on secured stuff that you can't forward, or B, you know, have barcode reading and stuff so we know where the documents are and they can't actually leave the building. But it's amazing to me. I mean, what, I mean I've been asked more about documents since I announced a month ago than probably any other topic. And, and it, to me, it's like, it, it, this, it, it's just, wow, we have a hundred things that are bigger issues than this facing us as a country. And I have to just sort of imagine that people are sitting in China laughing that we're spending all this time, you know, talking about this stuff over and over and over again. Because I guess it's, you know, it's great clickbait and it's great for TV, but it's not the biggest issue that we have. The issue is, do we have a justice system that people trust? And can we focus on the things that matter most to improve the lives of every American? And that's, we're trying to, trying to break through, you know, what, what our campaign is about is we want to get into the things that, you know, give us safer cities that, you know, solve the problems that we have in the thing, make us more competitive on the global market. And, and these are, uh, and again, these are, you know, uh, these are interesting hypothetical questions. You know, if this, if that, you know, if convicted, well, you know, I, I'm a governor. I get to decide whether I would pardon people or not. But if someone walked up to me today in North Dakota and said, hey, they haven't had the trial yet. You haven't heard the defense. You haven't heard the prosecution. But what if it came out this way in 2025? Would you pardon the person? I would like. I'm not speculating on that. Why would I do that? Let the, you know, let the let the thing. You know, everybody's innocent until they're proven guilty. Let it go through. Then talk to me about it. Uh, and, and if you, if somebody wants this to go away with a pardon right now, then President Biden is the only one that could pardon him. If he said, Hey, we want to, we want to have a. Convent, we want to have an election that's about the future instead of the past, then Biden could pardon Trump and then we could stop talking about documents and we could just say, okay, let's talk about economic records, let's talk about inflation, let's talk about national security, let's talk about the issues of the future that matter to all Americans as opposed to, as opposed to documents. But again, when I'm president, we won't have a document management problem. I mean, a thousand companies have fixed this problem. I mean, I mean, no board of directors would let former CEOs leave with all kinds of documents. I mean, this is this has been solved over and over and over and over again. I, it's, it's, it kind of makes the federal government not look that competent. Uh, you know, that erodes trust also. Okay. Let's get our next right. question from Laura Landerman Garber. Hi, Laura. Hi there. Is Thank you for Laura. 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 Yes. Laura. Laura. Thank you okay. for coming to New Hampshire. Um, Love your shirt flag, nice. I thought you might. Yeah. Uh, um, I like what you said about being a president to all Americans. So my question is, is going to sort of challenge that, if you will. Um, I hope I have this correct, so please correct yep. me if I have it wrong. But I understand you've signed approximately eight anti-transgender LGBTQ bills in the last year or so. Not, not true. Okay, how many? Uh, two. Okay, two. So the press, I read it wrong in the yeah, press. Okay, yeah. so two. I still have my question yeah. for you, though. Um, and if I understand that it's banning any treatment for transgender minors 
and potential sanctions for anybody who provides treatment for them. Is, is that correct? Yeah, well, there was a ban on, on for under age of 18. Minors, yes. Yeah, under age of 18 for life-altering surgeries okay. uh, in the state of North Dakota, uh, yes. Okay, and potential sanctions for anybody that breaks through that. Okay, so I am a psychologist of 40 years, so there's a lot of discussion about mental health yeah. that we could have. Um, but I work with a lot of teens, and some of them are exploring their gender identities. Mm -hmm. And as no more as I would dare to question how you govern, because you're a professional and you're a governor, I wonder how you question my professionalism of 40 years of being a clinical psychologist of treating these teens and offering care and help to them. Tie that into one more little question is we have HIPAA. It's a federal law, mm -hmm. a medical, you know, protection of medical records. How would you even know? And how do you think that intersection comes about? Well, I, first of all, thank you for the important work you're doing. Uh, because uh, there's not enough of you doing the work that you're doing. And I know that I'm sure the work that you've done has made a difference in lots of people's lives. And I think with the uh, state of North Dakota, like uh, a lot of states have, have said, that we think that uh, the kind of uh, you know counseling you're doing is super important. It can address all the, the work you're doing, but for re relative to life-altering surgeries, once person's 18, they can pursue that and do that, but we shouldn't be doing that when kids, we don't let kids smoke in North Dakota under 18. We don't let them, we don't let them drink. We don't let them join the military. There's a lot of things that we tell kids under 18 they can't do, and this is one of the things that, the, that in North Dakota uh, became law. But what, again, this is up to states. It's not up to the federal government. And, and what might work for North Dakota may be different for a lot of other states, and we'll see that. But again, as president, this is not the thing the president should be focusing on because exactly. this isn't part of the job of the president of the United States. Exactly, but how do you think it intersects with both HIPAA and mental health treatment? Because are you saying that you don't uh, approve of life-altering physical surgical interventions for minors, but what about mental health treatment? for minors who are, who are actively addressing, struggling, exploring these issues? Well, I think this is a, you're, you're on the edge of where uh, a lot of these laws are new. There'll be challenges, they'll be pushed back. And, but I think, again, providing uh, behavioral and mental health for our youth is critically important. Even with transgendered youth? Absolutely. I mean, we, we so there's not sanctions against someone like me who would be treating, caring for minors who are exploring these issues. Uh, all the all of the traditional therapies in terms of you know mental and behavioral health, but uh, life altering you know life altering drugs and life altering surgeries in North Dakota. But again, this is not the job of the president of the United States. Every state's going to have a different take on this, and if people don't people are uncomfortable with those outcomes, then uh, jump in the debate, run for the legislature, challenge it in court. Uh, but again, you know, activating these kinds of things where these are these divisive issues is a, basically we should say in America, wake up because these are things that divide, divide us. And it's okay to have those debates, but we, we should be uh, a nation where we're you know, trying to think about how do we care about you know, those that are the most vulnerable. I mean, we should, be, we should absolutely be doing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got about two minutes left, Governor, and I just wanted to ask you a question about your state, North Dakota. What is the biggest thing that the rest of the country gets wrong about North Dakota? <laughs> well, uh, I would say the, uh, we, we throw people off with uh, the label North because people do presume that uh, we are so you know, far north, but actually North Dakota is the center of North America. Uh, there's a little town called Rugby, North Dakota. They actually had a debate with another town in North Dakota, which is oddly called Center, about which one actually was the center of the uh, North America. But we are, we are in the center of, of the whole place. And I think one of the things that people don't understand is the important role that we play uh, in feeding the world, fueling the world as a huge, uh, we're an energy superpower, we're an agricultural superpower. Uh, and we, we also, of course, play an important role in, in, in national defense because of uh, the, the large uh, military presence we have there between the Minot Air Force Base, the Grand Forks Air Force Base. The other thing which I think people don't understand is that we are a, a we are 
a state, everybody knows we're hardworking. We have the highest workforce participation in the nation. We've got some of the lowest unemployment and we're on track to have the highest GDP. Our economy is just completely zooming in income growth, which is something we would want for the whole nation. A report came out yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, North Dakota, number one in the country, 9.7% uh, income growth. So that's uh, tracking ahead of inflation. So real income growth as opposed to, we grew a little bit, but it was less than inflation. So we, we feel like we've got a, a very important role to play. And then the other thing, which uh, here in New England, we should know when you're trying to get the size of this thing, North Dakota is the size of all six New England states. So Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. And they say, you're from a small state. And I'm like, yeah, but when it's snowstorm, we got to plow, you know, we got we don't, very few people. We got to plow like six states worth of uh, roads. We got to fight, you know, six states worth of floods. I mean, all the things that we have to do. So we've got a great uh, team of people in North Dakota doing uh, doing doing great things. And, and uh, we're excited to tell the, North Dakota story. Could they add one more title, Cradle of Presidents? We'll find out. Governor yes. Burgum, thanks so much for joining yeah. us on Conversation thank with you, the Candidate. We appreciate the time. Thank you to the audience, and thank, thank you, you for watching it home.